How many of you felt the presence of the Lord this morning? Hallelujah. All of our kids this morning that are in the house of the Lord with us this morning, so good to see you guys today. We're going to be turning in our Bibles this morning, first to Luke chapter 22, and then we're going to turn over to John chapter number 21, try to follow the leading of the Lord this morning. If you'd like to get there this morning, Luke chapter number 22. Luke's Gospel, chapter number 22, first. And once you have it, if you'd like to stand for the reverence of God's Word for just a moment. And then again, we'll turn from there to John, chapter number 21, and we'll start with verse 11 there. But first, we're in uh, verse 31 of chapter 22 in Luke. And if you have it this morning, say amen. Amen. Luke 22 and 31 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. When thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. He said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. As we read in Luke's gospel this morning, it appears to have taken place the night before the Lord's betrayal, just before the Lord would be crucified, taken to be mocked, ridiculed, betrayed. The night that they sat and ate the Passover meal. And as you see in Luke's gospel, they sit around that dinner table. And as they sit around that supper table and begin to partake and break bread together, Jesus begins to question Peter about his love relationship with him. But he says this to him. He says, Simon, Satan has desired to have you that he may sift you as wheat. But he says, I prayed for thee that thy faith fail not when you're converted. Strengthen the brethren. The Bible tells us here, he said unto him, "Go." But he said, I'll go into prison. I'll go to death and all of this. And Jesus lets him know something very profound. He says to him, the cock shall not crow this day before thou shalt thrice, three times, deny that thou knowest me. When we look in John's gospel, another passage that the Lord has led me to this morning. I want you to see that in John's gospel, it appears to be a time when Jesus has just been crucified. And this is the third time that he appears before his disciples. You remember the story where the Bible tells us that they had been on the ship all night long and they'd been casting their nets and they had taken nothing. Jesus shows up and he tells them to cast the net on the right side of the ship. Shortly thereafter, they come to shore. They sit down by fire. When they sit down by the fire, they begin to eat. And this is when Jesus begins to speak to Simon Peter. John chapter 21 and verse 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to the land of, and full of great fishes in 150 and 3. And for all there was so many, yet was not the net broken. Jesus saith unto him, Come and dine. None of his disciples durst ask him, Who art thou, knowing that it was the Lord? Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them, and fish likewise. Now this is the third time that Jesus showeth himself. Praise the Lord. This is the third time the scripture says that Jesus showeth himself to his disciples after that he was risen from the dead. So when they had dined, Jesus saith unto Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? He saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. 
And then in verse 16, he saith to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my sheep. And then in verse 17, he saith unto him the third time to him, Simon, praise the Lord. This, this is the first time that I have actually used this tablet. And Sister Amanda, this thing keeps jumping all over the place. Bless the Lord. Hallelujah. Anyhow. Yeah, hallelujah. You know what? Technology is a great thing whenever it works. Glory to God. Amen. Let, let me show you how you do this. Somebody say, help Jesus. Ain't that the truth? But he said to him that third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou? And Peter was grieved, but because he said unto him the third time, lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. And Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. With the Lord's help this morning, I'd like to preach a message that he has uh, burned into my spirit on what pressure reveals. What pressure reveals. Will you stretch your hand to the Lord and ask God, to have his way in this service here to, this morning. Lamb of God, we're thankful for the privilege to be called your church, your bride. I'm asking you, God, this morning for the next few moments that you will begin to speak to us through the word of God. You'll begin to talk to us through the power of your spirit. We're going to glorify you. We're going to praise you. We're going to magnify you for everything that you do in this place this morning. We thank you, God, that the word is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword and it will get into the place that we need it to get into. Use me as a vessel of honor. Meet for the master's use. Prepare unto every good work. We'll praise you for everything that is accomplished. And all of God's people can say amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I believe that there is a very unique connection that God showed me when I began to study this. A connection between the text in Luke 22 and a connection between the, the text and John chapter 21. It is what I'm going to call this morning a reference of the threes. The three opportunities. I want you to see this as the Holy Ghost began to reveal it to me. In Luke's gospel we see how the Lord showed Peter that when faced with three opportunities. Whenever he was in the presence of the public eye. Whenever Jesus would be led to the betrayal. That in the face of all of that pressure and the hot situation and circumstances, that Peter would deny the Lord three times. Then we read in John's gospel. This is an account that took place after what Peter had already done. And I find it amazing. I want you to kind of think of this in your mind. We have a setting where they're sitting at, at supper, the Passover and in the beginning, they're sitting at this Passover supper and the Lord confronts Peter about his love relationship, tells him that he will one day deny him. And now he's already done this. He's already denied them. And now Jesus shows himself a, a third time after he has been crucified. He stands before them as they sit at supper another time at another location and another day. Jesus has already been crucified. And now we look at John's gospel and we see that Jesus is questioning Peter in the private company of his brethren about his love for Christ in these three separate times. Three different times he asked him the question, lovest thou me, Peter? And Peter each time tells him, yes, I love you. I want you to kind of think of it this way. What would it feel like to be Peter after you know that there was a previous occasion where that you sat at a dinner table much like you were doing right that very moment and the Lord challenged you about your love for him and told you that there would be a time that you would deny him. There would come a day whenever you would deny him three times before the rooster crowed and now here you are. He's already been crucified and now you sit beside at a dinner table and you are confronted once again with a very similar questionnaire from the Lord himself where God looks at this man Peter and he says do you love me I mean that is putting a man on the spot that's like having a marriage where that a wife or a husband has been unfaithful and you know it they know it 
And now here you sit, you look them in the wide of their eyes and you say, do you love me? Will you be faithful to me? They know in the back of their mind that they have failed you in the past. But you see, when I look at these two different situations and I understand the complexity of both, I have to come away and say, oh, what a difference that pressure makes. Think of it this way. As Peter sits in the company of his brothers the first time, as Peter sits in the company of his brethren the third time, each time that he was sitting in the company of his friends and his fellow church members, if I can put it that way, each time that he is in that circumstance, he is quick to say, I love you. He is quick to say, I would go all the way to prison for you. I will stand by your side no matter what the enemy throws at me. I will be faithful to you all the way to the end. But yet, we find Peter in another situation in the second circumstance and Peter stands before the crowd's eye. He stands in the public eye as they look at him and Jesus is being betrayed. He's being led away, mocked. He is about to be led to be crucified and yet Peter denies him when it mattered the most. I want you to know that it's one thing for us to say that we love the Lord in the company of our brothers and sisters. It is one thing for us to high hat one another and say, oh, I love God. It's one thing for us to look at one another as we sing songs about, oh, how I love the Lord. But there are going to be times that you're going to be in the pressure cooker of everyday life. And when you're out there is when it really, really matters. It's easy to say you love the Lord when everybody's sitting around you is saying, I love the Lord. It's easy to say, I love the Lord when we're singing songs about lifting up and giving praise to our God. But it is not as easy when we are out there and we're in the heat and the hot trials of everyday battles. Uh, Does anybody understand what I'm saying? That is when faith is really proved. Uh, You will never know how faithful your spouse will be in marriage until they are put in a place where they are tempted to to mess up, to slip up, to fall. Say amen. You'll never know if your spouse sat in a dark black room with the lights turned out all by theirself with nobody else around them no temptation you would never really know just how true the words that they spoke when they said I'll be faithful to you to the death's end you never really know until you are put through the test of everyday life so it is no coincidence this morning even though that you and I do not like trials if you love trials go ahead and say amen but I don't I don't. But, I, but, but the thing is, we don't like pressure. We don't like to fight. And you may say, I hadn't long been serving the Lord. And it seems like I'm getting it on all sides. I feel like Job in some ways. But sometimes we have to allow God to let these things transpire to prove in us that I love you no matter what. It doesn't matter if my bank account's full or I'm trying to find how I'm going to pay my car payment. It doesn't matter if all my kids are perfectly healthy or there's something wrong with one of them and I'm having to stay all week in the hospital down at Arna Palmer. I still will love you. It doesn't matter if my husband decides uh, he doesn't want to love me and he's wanting a divorce. Uh, I ain't going to be happy. I'll be miserable but God I will serve you no matter what anybody else does. It doesn't matter if I didn't get the promotion that I feel like I deserve. Uh, it doesn't matter if I go to work uh, and everybody else getting accolades. uh, The people that never work hard. uh, And here I am over here. I'm the one that's always on time. I'm the one that's always fighting. I'm the always the one trying. uh, And yet everybody else is getting a pat on the back. And I feel discouraged uh, and defeated. uh, But yet I'm not going to denounce Christ. Uh, I could be like Job. uh, Sitting in an ice pile. Scraping out my balls. uh, Feeling sorry for myself to a degree. But I'm going to look up to God and say yea though he slay me yet will I trust him. It doesn't matter if there's a rainbow in the clouds uh, or it's dark and stormy and gloomy I will serve him anyhow. It doesn't matter uh, if my car's got four bald tires uh, or I just got a new set put on. Uh, It doesn't 
matter if the car ain't got gas or I just filled the tank. I'm going to serve you anyhow. It doesn't matter if that piece of junk stays broke down more than it's on the road. I'm going to serve you anyhow. Say amen, somebody. It doesn't matter if my whole family says I don't want nothing to do with you. Hey amen. I'm still going to serve you. Somebody say that's kind of the kind of made up mind I got this morning. Somebody give God praise. It is amazing when you stop and think about the breakdown, the difference that pressure makes, the difference that the crowd can make. Do you know that if your love ain't right, you get around the right crowd and you're going to act different? Is there anybody besides me? You wouldn't want to be married to somebody that didn't act like they didn't love you in a crowd. Now what kind of love is You ever had friends like that? I mean, when I was younger, maybe you didn't have this happen. But I had a couple friends along the way. But if it was just me and them, they act like I was the best thing since cornbread and collard greens. Huh? But the moment they get around a few other people, they don't know who I am. What kind of friendship is that? Huh? Sometimes when you get in the heat of pressure... I've told this story before. It's kind of comical in one way, in one respect, but it was ridiculous in another respect. I was a young man. We used to fight all the time when I was in high school. I was on the way back from school. We used to walk the railroad tracks, and me and one of my closest friends, you know your friends, I said, man, if you ever get in a fight, buddy, I got you back. I mean, I'll stand up for you. And there we were. We were taking rocks off the railroad tracks and throwing them off to the side. Well, lo and behold, I had a bunch of other kids that were going to try to ambush us as we walked up there and one of the kids had a beef with me and so whenever I was walking down the tracks he stepped out and he said oh I saw you threw a rock in my grandma's house and grandma didn't even live there I think his grandma it wasn't even alive but anyway he lied and he tried to come up with some excuse well some reason that he was going to try to uh, confront me and so now I'm, I've got like it looks like a swarm of bees I got several people that are all around me that, you know my best buddy my, my, my you know partner in crime The one that's got my back did not have my back. I wanted to knock him upside the head when I was done. Where were you? I mean, you said you would be with me. You understand what I'm about? Where was you at? You let me sit there and get attacked by about five or six different people. What kind of friendship is that? It's easy. I heard one man say, the mouth will say anything. Jesus said in one place of the word of God, he said they confess with their lips, but their heart is far from me. How many of you this morning say, God, don't ever let me be like that. I want to have the love, the kind of love that if they came and tomorrow and they said that the government's turned upside down or Russia came in or China came in, amen, it blew us up and took over and said to us, look, from here on out, you're going to have to deny the Lord, amen, or else we're going to take you to the chopping block or we're going to line you up and shoot you down. How many of you this morning could do like a little girl in an elementary school when two young teenage boys walked in with guns and said, who here? serves the Lord Uh, and one little girl that stood up for her faith and died for her faith Uh, let me tell you there's a lot of people that do a lot of this uh, but how many says I'll go all the way I've got a love for him he's done too much for me for me to quit on him you know this morning if these stories tell us anything is we can we can be completely in love with Christ to a degree but our love not be perfected. Let me show you something here from the text. Jesus says in one portion, he says, I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. Is that what he said? But if you read the story and you're reading it from the perspective or the vantage of trying to prove the word of God wrong, you would say, why did Jesus Pray that his faith fail not, and yet he still denied the Lord. Wouldn't you consider that, Brother Myers, a failure of his faith? You see, let me show you something this morning. There are going to be times that you and I may fail, but your faith that you have in the bedrock of who Christ is may not waver at all. 
What do you mean by that? Let me explain myself this morning. There have been times as a child, I had a rough upbringing, and I, I was very a, a bad child. I'll just put it that way. I was really a terrible child. And I can tell you that as that terrible child, I loved my parents, but there were times that my parents, especially when I got older, we had fallings out with each other. Anybody else ever had that with your kids or you with your parents? But yet, I never lost faith in my parents. You see, there's a difference between when you lose faith in the relationship with that father, that earthly father, or that earthly mother. There's a difference between the fact that you deny them. You don't want to know anything about them. But on the surface, here's what Peter does. Peter stands in a mixed company, and Peter's flesh gets afraid. He's so afraid that he may die that his flesh man says the dumbest thing and says, I don't know him. But you see, Peter really on the inside, wanted to do what was right otherwise he would have never got right but Peter wanted to do right but his flesh man got him sidetracked he never lost his internal faith but he made himself look foolish by saying that he didn't know who he was you see you can fail and never lose that internal faith that you know he's God that's the reason why that there are people that may have failed God many times over but they say I still know he lives I still I still know he's the best thing going. I still know he's my bread in the morning and my drink in the day, say amen. But Peter shows us in the word of God just what Jesus was trying to reveal to us. And I, I come across something that I wanted to share with the church. I read a story of a man who one time he was in, his family was in the copper mining business. I don't know a whole lot about copper mining, so I had to do a little bit of research myself. But as I began to look, I found that he used a word that is called ore. Now, if you ask a southern boy like me, ore, I'm thinking something you put in your john boat when you go fishing. But he said that ore they would have to have as their stable product to work with, to break it down for copper mining. So, Sister Amanda, I looked it up in the Britannica, and, and it began to explain in the Britannica that what what, what was saying here is that there is no more deposits, constant, well, no ore deposits in, consist entirely of a single ore mineral. The ore is always mixed with unwanted or valueless rocks and minerals that are collectively known as ganja. You see, not, not the same kind of marijuana stuff, y'all. Not that. What exactly is ore? Or is a substance that was naturally created like a mass or a rock. What they would do is they take that natural substance. Some of them say that it might have been quite like ash or, or molten rock that came from a volcano. And it is the first state of the product. They take that, that piece. And there are two different ways that they would break it down. The first way, they would put the ore in a blast furnace and raise the temperature to as much as 2,300 degrees to burn off the impurities. And everything that was left, they got rid of everything that was unwanted and everything that was left, they would turn that into copper. Then another way they would do it, they would grind the ore into a fine powder and flood it with water uh, to float off the impurities. Do you see this morning that whenever they would mine that copper, they start off with a product that has got a lot of unmixed in things that are unwanted stuff, a lot of minerals and there may be other types of metal, but they've got to separate the valueless stuff that is not right, uh, the stuff they cannot use. They've got to break that away and they're either going to take it and put so much pressure on that rock that they grind it into a powder substance. For them to grind it into powder, they've got to put pressure on the rock and turn it into powder. Then they're going to take water. Do you know that he uses the water of the word, the water of the truth, uh, to float away those impurities? Uh, and you may be saying, Pastor, I for the life of me cannot understand why my family has been going through hell and high water. 
I cannot understand why it seems like I'm fighting the devil on every single side. Be thankful to God that you're in a process right now that God says, before I can turn you into fine copper, I've got to put you in the oven. I've got to grind you to powder and let you see where the real truth of your love is. You see, this morning for pressure will reveal what is good and what is not good. It is either love accepted or love rejected. You see, the truth is that we have all been acquainted with people that say that they love us. But in reality, they don't really, really, really love us. There are people that are in church, and I'm not trying to throw off on anybody. Please don't misunderstand, but there are people that attend church, and there are people that go to church for various reasons other than to have a personal one-on-one relationship with God. Well, Pastor, I was raised in this, and Mama said it was right, so I'm just doing it because Mama said it's right. It's like the old analogy that I heard years ago where that a husband and wife got married and she was young and uh, one day he walked into the kitchen and looked over and he was trying to figure out for the life of him why that his wife took the roast and cut one end of it off and then turned it around and cut the other end of it off and stuck it in the oven. He said, honey, uh, if you don't mind me asking, you know, all my family, they're all cooks, and I have never in my life seen anybody cut the both ends of the roast off like that. And uh, she said, well, that's just the way my mama did it. So I just the way I did it. You know, I put it, just cut the ends off the roast, put it in there. But if it worked for mama, it must work for me. And so she said, to be honest with you, I don't know why I cut the ends of it off. So she called her mama, and her mama said, honey, I don't know. I saw great-grandma do that, and so that's what I did. Finally, they got a hold of great-grandma, and great-grandma said, oh, baby, the reason and that I did that because my pan was so small that I couldn't fit the roast so I just cut both ends of it off so it would go in the pan. You see, well, let me tell you, there are people that go to church for the wrong reason. There are people that try to serve the Lord for the wrong reason. Let me tell you, if you're not in this for a one-on-one relationship, it's time for you to get right back down on your knees and say, Lord, let me fall in love with you one more time. I want you to be my bread in the times of trouble. I want you to be my peace when the times of stress. I need you to come on now, somebody. I need you more than I need lorazepam. I need you more than I need oxycodone. I need you more than I need another Xanax. I need you more than I need, come on, somebody, another drink of alcohol. I need you. I need you. I need you. When you finally get to that place where you need him, your reliance is on him. Amen. The Lord may say the reason why that you've been going through it is just like Peter. I ask you, do you love me? You said yes. I said, do you love me? You said yes. But then you turned when you you got out there and what you said doesn't really line up you said you love me but you know what the word of God says he said if you love me keep my commandments you can't you can't jump up and say I love him with every single you know for years we had a trend in the church I haven't seen this happen as much recently. Matter of fact, I don't see too many people testify as much as they used to. That's another message. But there was a trend for many years where people would jump up on their feet and they would say, I love the Lord with all of my heart, mind, soul, strength, and body. Glad to be a great member of the church of God and sit down. And I've always said, sometimes I wonder if people understand the gravity and the value of making a statement as bold as saying, I love God with all of my... Do you understand what that encompasses? That means there's no room in there for any other junk. But I love God with all, all, A-L-L, all of my... There's nothing else there. Do you know that to say that you love God with all of your heart, that means He comes before your hobbies. If you love God with all of your heart, He comes before everything else. You can't say you love God with all of your heart when His Word takes second place in your life, when the church takes second place in your life, and you don't mind going and going to a movie theater and spending $75 to pay and that big Hollywood superstars that... 
amen, that that support such a a, a compromise agenda and yet we come to the house of God. Amen, please don't misunderstand and don't get mad at the preacher but we think we're doing God a big old favor by dropping that same dollar we've been dropping since 1948. I'm not, man, if that's all you got, then God bless you. You might be like the little woman who put everything she had but let me tell you, when our cable bills more than our ties, uh, you know where your priorities are. Uh, Amen, you'll make sure you got the latest iPhone. uh, uh, Come on now, somebody help me get with me here. You make sure your children got the newest PS4 if you can afford it. uh, But come on now, whenever you love God with all of your heart, you begin to put the things of God before everything else. Uh, Let me tell you, when God sees you begin to put his house, his things, him, his word before everything else, uh, you'll be seen, begin to see the Lord uh, open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you ain't got room to receive. Uh, Is there anybody besides me that says, God, if you find anything in me that don't belong there, God, get it out of me. Do you remember the Lord saying, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Peter's name meant a rock. Peter was addre- Jesus was addressing Peter and he said, upon this rock I will build my church. When Jesus ascended back to heaven, Peter became like a main spokesman, like a primary minister of the gospel. He became a leader of sorts, like a head pastor or a regional overseer. And the Lord was going to allow Peter to guide, amen, like a pastor leading a flock his church and he said upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it he was going to use the man of God whose spirit the spirit of God would flow through do you understand this morning there are people sitting here that you have the potential to do the same thing the New Testament church did to turn the world upside down we've got world changers sitting right here in this house the devil may have you beat up and defeated and say you can't do nothing right But honey, if you ever sell out, you're going to blow your own mind uh, of just what God could do through you. But you see, before God can use the clay, God's got to mold it uh, just like that clay on a potter's wheel before that clay can ever hold a vase full of flowers. uh, Before somebody uh, before that you can ever pour water into that pitcher it's got to be fe- heated up uh, it's got to be cured in the furnace uh, you mean you got to get it hot enough uh, to cure the clay uh, somebody say God uh, amen if you got to keep me in the furnace uh, if it gets hot for a while I know that in the end uh, you're going to perfect in me what you want I'm not going to bail out on you because it gets difficult and hard huh To me, some of the saddest stories I've ever heard. I've heard a lot of terrible, sad things. But to me, there is nothing much lower between a husband and a wife for a spouse to leave another person because they go through a physical battle. What do you mean, Brother Myers? Well, let me put it like this. If you've got a husband that only loves you because you're skinny, if you got a wife that only loves you whenever you're at the gym and working out, if you got a, a wife that only loves you whenever you're banking big dollars, something's wrong with that love. Huh? But when people stay with somebody whenever they, like for example, in one story that I'm aware of, a woman who was absolutely beautiful, one of the most gorgeous women. She could probably be a Photoshop a emblem on Vogue magazine or whatever, a beautiful lady as, as appeared to society's uh, way of judging beauty. And yet this woman got into a bad car accident. The car caught on fire and the majority of her face looked like somebody took a candle, wax and melted. It just kind of looked like wax dripping down. Her face had been absolutely destroyed. But you understand, that face was only part of the shell that inhabited that spirit and soul. She was just as loving, just as compassionate, the same person on the inside. Nothing had changed about her. She was still the same woman, but her husband decided that she was too ugly to be married to anymore. So in the worst time, 
time of her life when she needed him the most, he walked out on her. Honey, that ain't love. But I'm telling you, there's a God that loves you. No matter if your face was disfigured, if you got diabetes and lost both your legs, say amen. If you had to have one of your kidneys removed, come on, if you lose both your arms, let me tell you, I know a God who said if you're a quadriplegic, I'm the God of the quadriplegic. God said if you if you're not as smart as your next door neighbor and your IQ ain't very high, God said I'm the God of the high IQ and I'm the God of the lower IQ. I'm God of all flesh. But I think it's one of the saddest things to imagine that somebody's love would not be big enough that when the pressure is on that they just up and quit. But you see the thing about Peter, Peter acknowledged that he he messed up. Peter acknowledged that he failed God. Is there anyone here this morning? You don't have to raise your hand. But you are willing to admit, I have failed him. I acknowledge. I've said things. I've talked about people. I've been unforgiving. I stood at the time clock for an extra 30 minutes so I could get an extra 30 minutes on my... I stole, took what didn't belong to me. I failed. I know I failed. You see, Jesus knew that he was going to use Peter in the most profound way. Here is a man, Brother Kuhn, that stood up and we see thousands of people thousands not one not two not ten not five not a hundred or 150 thousands get saved from one sermon how does a man who utterly failed God in the worst way in the eye of the public but he still has enough of love for God inside of him that says I will go all the way to the death how does he get up because sometimes God says, I've got a greater place that I'm taking you. I'm not leaving you. Somebody's getting a word this morning. I am not leaving you right here. You're at a place you've been at way too long. I'm not leaving you here. I am taking you somewhere else. And it's going to get hotter before it gets better. I said it's going to get hotter before it gets better. You're going to wonder if God's listening. You're going to pray and wonder if God still hears you. But hang in there. Hang in there, honey. You hang in there. It's going to get hotter before it gets better. But after a while, God will reveal his purpose to you. And just like the man of God, Peter, you'll be able to look across the crowd and be used of God in a great professing way. You'll be able to be used of God in a mighty, powerful way. But you have got to re- got Allow God to reveal the weaknesses and the vulnerabilities inside of you. I heard a man say something many years ago that is, boy, is this so true. He said that he was talking to another wise preacher. And he said, you know the difference between some really judgmental people judging people who have fallen to the incredible vice of temptation The only difference between some people and the people they judge is the right opportunity hasn't come along yet. Oh, yeah. If you were put in just the right position, that's the only difference between some people. Some. Some will be like Joseph who didn't even have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and tell Potiphar's wife, "Uh uh-uh, baby, go on with yourself. Take my coat with you. You can't, you, you, you can't have what God's blessed me with. But the only difference between some people is the right opportunity. They haven't been left in a room with several hundreds or thousands of dollars all by themselves, And nobody would know. They haven't been in a situation where an old fling contacted them on Facebook in private and said, hey, what do you say we go have dinner sometime by ourselves? The right opportunity hadn't come up just yet. I'm not saying everybody will do that. But before you go high-hatting yourself about how good you are, how, how but sometimes God has to send the right thing along to, to reveal the vulnerabilities and the weaknesses within you, say amen, somebody. 
I can tell you that when we get to that place and God said, look, I found something in you that I don't like. And God said, look, I'm going to allow you to go through something. And if you'll yield to this trial that I'm allowing you to go through, you're going to see the things in you that are not pleasing to me. And when you come out on the other side, Job said, the yea, though he say me, yeah, well, I trust him. Do you know? He said, I'm going to come out of this like fine gold on the other side. I've been put in the furnace of affliction. There are some of you, your marriage has been put in the furnace of affliction. There are some of you, your business, your job has been put in the furnace of affliction. Amen. And the enemy's laughing at you. But I want you to get the last laugh. And you say you laugh all you want to. If my boss man fires me tomorrow and I lose my place or if my car never gets fixed, I'm going to get the last laugh. Because if I die trying, I'm going to die fighting. I'm going to die with peace knowing that I got God on my side. I might have to ride a moped to work, honey, but I'll be singing how I love Jesus on a moped all the way to work. If that's what it takes, I'd rather have him and live in a cardboard box than to have all the world and live in a mansion. Somebody say, if you love him, say I love him. Pressure reveals things in you. We like to believe the best of ourselves. But I, want you, I don't want you to raise your hand. I don't want you to raise your hand. I just want you to listen to me for a minute. Have you ever been in a situation where you thought to yourself, I can't believe I did that. I don't know any of us who probably can't, if you're honest. I can't believe I said that. Have you ever been in a mixed company with somebody and they're all gossiping? Next thing you know, you're celebrating with them. Yeah, that old scallywag. Sorry, joker. Y'all are supposed to be having dinner and you're having somebody else for dinner. Put them on the barbecue of hypocrisy. Huh? We're going to grill out tonight and we're having Brother Tatum with our taters. Huh? You find yourself in places and then you go home and you're like, oh God, I can't believe I just did that. Sometimes God allows those things to unfold and slap you right in the face so that God can say, look, that can't keep happening. I want to use you in a greater way. And I can't use you if you're going to let these vulnerabilities be in your life because those weaknesses will catch you. Because before God can take you to higher ground, you have to have a greater resistance. Come here for a second, Miranda. I know you don't mind. My daughter-in-law is one of the greatest daughter-in-laws a pastor or a man could ever ask for. But when until you develop a greater resistance, I'm going to just put your hand up. All right, just put your hand right, put both of them like this in front of you together. A greater resistance, what kind of push back on me? You see, whenever you're not where you need to be and you're like Peter and there's a little bit of weakness in you whenever the resistance of the world the push of the world you're going to start going back you're going to start being pushed back pushed back pushed back God said I can't use you because if I take you to the next place you're going to face greater pressure you're going to face greater problems and until I can use you in this place you've got to learn how am I preaching all right? I can't use you over here because you're so weak over here. You've got to strengthen yourself. Just like that that copper mining. They're going to put it in the blasting fire and they're going to break it down or they're going to take a pressure, a hammer or whatever and crush that rock. They're going to break it into powder and then they're going to break away and get rid of all the vulnerabilities. But I can guarantee you the day that Peter realized that he heard that crow of the rooster somebody in this congregation you didn't hear an actual rooster crow but you had the same exact thing happen to you recently and you woke up and came to yourself and you said I cannot believe I just did that I cannot believe I just allowed that to happen God said look if you're going to be the mama to your children that I need you to be I need you to be over here but you're still over here and you're weak you, you, you put up the resistance but after a while you begin to see Satan I know where my vulnerabilities are and I, I want you to act like you're sweeping I'm sweeping I'm sweeping out some areas in my life. I'm working on my faith. I've got whatever it may be. If it's my attitude, I'm sweeping house. Come on, somebody. For my faith, I'm sweeping the corner of faith. Come on, whatever it is, I'm working on it. So when the enemy comes back around the next time, amen, put up your hands. And the enemy's pushing against you. Amen, push on me, push on me, push on me. And the enemy's pushing. And the enemy said, hey, wait, something happened. I don't know what happened during the betrayal of Jesus. 
Jesus. But you learn where your vulnerabilities are. And this time the enemy said, that the, the Peter said, look, you're not getting me with the same old left hand jab. Let me tell you, if you've ever fought, I used to kickbox years ago. And if you're dumb enough to let somebody hit you with the same left hand jab every time, then you need to get out of the ring because you're going to get beat to death. you got to learn if that opponent comes at you with a left hand jab, you got to know, hey, the last time I fought, that's the mess that he used. If you got a weakness in your life, you better address it. If it's the internet, you better address it. Come on now. If it's your past, you better address it. If it's a weakness, you better address it. Because if not, you're not going to the next place. I'd like to see the saints of God putting up enough fight. Huh? I wonder if when the enemy comes against you that he meets with any resistance. Huh? The way I see a lot of church folk is that when the enemy comes along with temptation, don't put up much fight. When the enemy comes along with te- and just he's just pushing you all over the place. He's got you so depressed you got to go to the doctor to get help. He's got you so defeated that you done called five friends trying to get a word or encouragement or something because you're so low that you're ready to kill yourself. You don't even want to live anymore. And you, you, he's just pushing you all over the place. Just go that way. He's just pushing you everywhere. All over the place. Just push, 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 push. But the Lord said, I allowed you to go through some junk. And the reason I allowed you to go through some mess is because I'm trying to expose some vulnerabilities in you. The furnace will be hot. The pressure will be intense. If you're going to break something apart, you've got to put a lot of pressure on it. You may say, God, I can't believe. What are you doing? But God said, I know exactly what I'm doing. You're going to start seeing the areas. You could be clean, off the wagon, clean, have it used in six months. You're doing so well. And then all of a sudden, one of those friends that don't really use much or hasn't that you know of comes along and slips in a back door. See, if it would have been the drug dealer, you wouldn't have answered the phone. But he'll come. He'll find a way to work his way. It would be somebody you work with. It might even be somebody within your own family that if their mama knew what they was doing, they'd pull them aside and wear them out. Because they know that they're putting a stumbling block and tempting you. Because if there's a vulnerability, if you really want to get clean, if you want to get clear, if you're tired of using, if you're tired of being used and played in the hands of the enemy like a violin, if you're tired of that, you got to say, God, if the furnace of affliction makes comes to my betterment, God, let me go through this. Because when I come out on the other side, I know you're going to have something that you can work with. Is anybody here that says, God, I've known for years you wanted to do something from in me, but I've been running. I've been running so long, and I'm tired of running, God. I'm tired of running. Jonah, it's time to get on the right ship. You run so long, run so far, and you think you can get away from God's conviction. But is there anybody this morning that says, God, I'm fully aware that I can't run past your conviction. I stopped going to church thinking I could get away with it. I could get away from it. But I went to work and I felt conviction. I have to wonder this morning exactly who it is that God is trying to get their attention. In retrospect to everything, honestly, I believe it's every single one of us. I don't care if you're the prime minister of the whole entire church of God or you're the, you're the catalyst of all preachers. It doesn't make no difference. 
I have a message in, in, in file, I guess you'd say, that I never have put together, but God gave me a title many, 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 many years ago. Maybe somebody else has preached this, but this was something the Lord spoke into my spirit. And the title of that thought was, Oh, how the mighty have fallen. Oh, how the mighty. David, he was at the pinnacle of his life. You would have thought David had life by the tail. He had basically everything. He was a, he was a captain over a great army. He lived in a nice house. He had servants. He had people that waited on him hand and foot. He lived in the palace. And let me tell you, sometimes whenever you rise the highest, it's the very moment that pressure comes at you in the greatest way. I've had to humble my own self in the respect to say, I've often thought, Lord, I would love to be able to pastor 500 people. We couldn't fit 500 people in here, but we have the building next door, we could. I'd love to pastor 500 people. I was in a meeting. This has been a while ago, and it didn't fully set right with me when I heard it said, but a, a man that has been in ministry probably three times as long as I have, he stood up one day and he was talking about being an overseer over many different churches within the Church of God hub. And he said he had a man that came to him and wanted to leave one church and go to another church that ran about five times as many members as the church that he had pastored for a while. And he made a statement that night, if I can remember exactly the way he said it, along the lines, something along the lines of, this man's ministry is not the caliber of that many people. When I first heard that, I thought, that don't make no sense. I mean, what? But you know, the more I begin to think about it, there are certain levels of responsibility that comes with greater levels in the Lord. There are some people that ha don't have the capacity. That's the reason why the Lord gives out talents. One may have one talent. May, one may have two. One may have five. One may have three. I don't ever want a Sister Linda get pacified with pastoring 150 or 100. I don't ever want to get pacified with a number because to me, church isn't about numbers. But I will tell you this. I have had to come at rest and peace within myself. If I never pastor a mega church, if I never pastor 5,000, Sister Miranda, maybe it's because within my own personal life, that I never reached that place that God said I put you in the furnace and you were ready for the next level. You see, I can talk about me. I can talk about me. I would have used you in that class that you've always dreamed of being, but sister, you weren't ready. I can't barely get you to come to church faithfully. How can I use you to be faithful to teach little kids? Does that make sense? I want to give you an opportunity this morning. I preach this message to you with all the love that I can muster up within myself. I see this morning that there's a lot of you that have had tears in your eyes during this message. And I'm going to tell you something. It ain't because of me. It ain't because of me. It's because some of you are going through places and God pulled your mail right out of the mailbox and read it back to you. Some of you have been going through things and you know that God knows. He already knew before I ever got here. He gave me a message and I didn't know you would be here. He gave me a word and he said, preach this because there's some people, whether they were online or in this service, that have been going through one of the worst things of their life. He sees it. He knows. Sister Coon, can I ask you a very personal question? Do you really want to go all the way with the Lord? You see, the thing is, if I decide I'm going all the way, I might as well just go ahead and do it. Don't let distraction of the things that you've been through, the things you have fought against, the people and the preachers that have let you down, or anything else. You're like a locomotive right now. 
that has crested the top of the hill and it sees the bottom of that other hill and it's picking up speed. But I can tell you, you can, you can easily reach down and jam that emergency brake at any time and you can stop all that God's trying to do or you can say, look, it doesn't matter if I've got to go through a black tunnel and I can't see what's ahead of me. I'm going to trust you because I know you're leading me somewhere. you got something bigger and better inside it. Let me tell you, some of you that are here this morning, morning may not be natural born leaders but some of you are and you may not have discovered that talent within yourself but you have it it is there God will use you to use the things that he has blessed you to learn. Do you know we are in an age of technology right now? And some of you, God has learned you to use the things and discover things. God could use you in greater ways than you ever realized. There are some of you, you may never pastor a church, but let me tell you, if you want God to take you to another level, you're going to have to forsake some of the things that you think are so important. There are some of you that if you wanted to tomorrow, you could start an online ministry and you could start preaching and reading scripture out loud on your Facebook video and have an entire ministry and a following tomorrow if you really wanted to but I'm asking you are you ready to let God to take you in another place you've never been there are some of you that could break out your Bible on your lunch break and start reading the word of God opening up the opportunity for other people to ask you questions whether they mock you and laugh at you but let me tell you what I found the very crowd that laughed and mocked at me brother John when I sat and read my Bible at break time were the very ones that whenever their wife got cancer and they were in the bottom that they came to me and said hey they may say it quietly when nobody else can hear but they may say hey if you believe in God at all can you please pray for my wife I just found out she got stage 3 breast cancer can you please pray for my wife can you please pray for my son he got in a car accident last night because see here's the thing if you want to make a difference and you want to go to a place that you've never been before you want to be more dedicated than you've ever been before then you got to say God I understand that I'm in the furnace of affliction it feels like a pressure cooker right now But God, if you can make anything out of this lump of clay, I don't feel like very much. And I beat myself down so much that I can't see much. But if you see anything in me that's usable, God, get it out of me. Stand to your feet all across the church this morning. Brother John Henry, if you will, please come this morning. Well, I'm telling you, I feel the spirit of the Lord in this place. There's a sweet... There's a sweet spirit in this house. How many of you this morning can honestly say, I don't want you to raise your hand, but you have felt conviction. You felt that tugging, that pulling at your heart this morning. You feel the spirit of God breathing into your your heart and your life and saying, look, I want you to come up a little closer. I don't want you to stay where you're at. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed all across. Brother John's going to play something this morning. There are... I want to talk to those of you. Every head is bowed and eyes closed. I want to talk to those of you that are about ready to make a big decision in your life. I want to encourage you to know this. There are people standing all around you in this room that were once in the very same place that you are in right now. Some that if you ask them, they would tell you the only regret that they have is that they didn't do it sooner. The only regret they have He said they didn't listen to those that tried to tell them this is the answer. And I kept pushing it off saying, no, that's too simple. I need a pill. I need a counselor. I need something. I need a new relationship. I need a man. Ladies, let me tell you what bothers me is heads are bowed and eyes are closed. I've never seen a day in life and the likes of it that we have so many women that are so defeated that they feel like that they need a man to make them. A man does not make you. A man may help complete you, but a man does not make you. Your identity doesn't is not determined. Your value and your self-worth is not determined by who you are dating or who you are married to. That doesn't determine your value this morning. You are valuable in the eyes of God with or without a man. Men tell you the same thing. Stop living so defeated and on the bottom. In the eyes of God, I came to tell somebody, you are a somebody. He's seen you going through the affliction. He knows the fire has been hot. But he said, I'll do you just like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. If you're willing to jump into that fire, if you're willing to stand for me when everything else around you is falling apart, if you're willing to stand with me, you're going to look around and say, I see a fourth man in my fire. I'm going through it, Pastor. My my marriage is falling apart, but I got a fourth man in my fire. 
<laughs> well, Pastor, I'm sick in my body, but I got a fourth man in my fire. Pastor, my children don't want anything to do with me, but I got a fourth man in my fire. There are some of you that God's come to tell you this morning, I'll be with you. You won't be alone. I wonder is there somebody right now that's willing to step out and say I'm ready to give my life to the Lord. Maybe you're here, you're ready to rededicate. There's some already coming to the altar this morning. Will you be the next one to say I'm ready to commit all. I'm ready to go all the way. I'm ready to give all. Come on ladies, that's right. Come on to the altar. Oh yeah, come on saints of God and help me pray. There are some that have come down this morning and say I'm ready to go all the way. Come on saints of God. Sister Amanda Henry, please come here for a minute. Amen. Lord God, we're going to ask you to touch and move this morning. Come on Sister Miranda, come on. All you ladies, come on. I want some prayer warriors this morning. There are some that have come and said, I need God to touch me. Oh, yeah. Somebody get some oil this morning. Is there anybody else that's willing to be honest? Is there anybody else that's willing to say, I failed. I fell flat on my face. But like Peter, I'm coming out of this. Hallelujah. Oh, I feel the Spirit of the Lord in this house. Is there anybody, any, any mother, is there any mother that'd like to stand in the gap for their children? Is there anybody that says, I'm tired of, I'm tired of halfway. I'm ready to go all the way. Oh, God, come on, ladies. Help me pray. Come on, brothers, help me pray. I got family. I got friends that need to go all the way. I, I'm ready to see them go all the way. I'm tired of living like this. Woo! If there's anything in me, Lord, that don't belong there, I'm ready to lay it on the altar. I'm ready. There are some that had long done the very same thing you're doing. God bless you, sister. Come on, let the Lord touch you. From the crown of our head to the soles of our feet, we let the Lord speak to us, touch us in the mighty name of Jesus. Oh, yes. You've had a lot of people that have let you down. But I want to tell you something this morning. Of all the people that have let you down, there is one that will never forsake you, that will go all the way with you. When others walk right out the door and don't look back and then have the audacity to talk about you and all the secrets that you shared with them that have broadcasted and said to everybody else and condemn you and disqualify you. But God came this morning to tell you, you're not disqualified for heaven because the blood said you're qualified. Hallelujah, hallelujah. My God, this morning, touch our brothers. Lord, I'm laying my mind on this altar. I'm laying my heart on this altar. I'm getting things I've never had before. I'm going to go places I've never been. Woo! Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, ladies, pray for one another. Oh, I pray this morning, God, touch these sisters in the name of Jesus. I pray, God, let them feel the glory of God this morning. In Jesus' mighty name. Oh, I feel the power of God's presence in this house. Hallelujah. I feel the presence of the Master here. In Jesus' name. Lord God. Lord, I accept, I accept the help in the name of Jesus. I accept it. 
Come on. I'm trusting you right now. Come on, brothers, point your hand this way. If there's things I need to walk away from, give me the strength, God, to walk away from what needs to be walked away from. Stand up. Be accounted for. Sometimes, sometimes the beginning of happiness, sometimes the beginning of greatness, sometimes the beginning of what you need in God is as simple as, I'm sorry, Lord. I see, I see where I fell, I see where I've fallen. I need more of you. Is there anybody here that? You feel the touch of the Lord. I want you to just take a minute, get your mind clear of everything all around you. I want you to slip both hands up if you're able. And I want you to thank God for what you felt this morning. We are are so quick to say, God, we'll be careful to give you the honor, the glory, and the praise for what you do. Unfortunately, we're not always quick to say thank you when the Lord speaks to you. When God deals with you and shows you things, we're not always as quick to say thank you. I believe you ought to just thank him and say, I I appreciate, I appreciate. It may be hard, maybe times that it's tough, but the Lord said in his word in the book of Revelation, he said, be zealous, be zealous, be zealous therefore and repent. Because he said, for them that he loves, he chastens. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Lord, I see you're doing something. You're doing something. In me, you're doing something in this church. My God, we praise you this morning. Is anyone here this morning that says, Brother Myers, I know what my vulnerabilities are. I already know. I know what they are. For those of you that know, be thankful. For those of you that say, I'm not 100% sure, just give it time. The furnace of affliction will reveal the things that are of no value. And those impurities, God with the breath of his nostrils can blow those impurities away the way they do in that copper mining. Take the water of the word and float those impurities away. We're going to dismiss this morning as we get ready to. I want to remind you that we will have no service Thursday night. There'll be no service Thursday night due to our Thanksgiving holiday. If you ever would like to know, keep up with the memory verses. I always encourage, we don't do it just for the sake of doing it. I encourage you to get the Word of God into your heart. It's a lot easier to battle the enemy when you have the tools to fight him with, the Word to give him. It's a lot easier to win that person on your job if you know the Word and you can give them the Word. This is what the Bible says. 
that you don't have to say, hang on, let me call my pastor and see what he's got to say about it, that you know yourself. <laughs> Amen. So, so blessed to pastor you good people. A good crowd this morning. We're looking forward to seeing you next Sunday morning, Lord willing. Next Sunday night, if all goes well, next Sunday being the last Sunday of the month, if that's the case. Am I is that right, Sister Myers? Sometimes after I get done preaching, my, my, my mind's like hairs. They're all crossed. And I uh, just want to confirm that as we get ready to dismiss. Thank you for those of you that showed up last night to the, uh, to the uh, fellowship, fall fellowship we had, campfire and what have you. Hope you enjoyed yourself. I hope you had a good time. Uh, that's the whole reason and purpose we got together was just to have a, try to have a good time of fellowship. All right, stand to your feet. Did you look at the calendar, Sister Myers, for me? Okay, so next Sunday night, it is confirmed, next Sunday night is our end of the month, end of the month fellowship. Yes, yes. We'll be having service tonight. We'll see what the Lord has in store for us. How many is going to come tonight ready to have church? And uh, be excited about it because I tell you what, we've been having some great services, but I know that there's so much more, so much more to experience. It does my heart good to see the people that have been praying and worshiping the Lord. I tell you what, it makes for a beautiful church service. If you will, bow your heads this morning. Brother Benefield, if you will, please dismiss us in a word of prayer. Brother Danny.